All right, so the big question is, why cloud applications in the first place? And why do they require a different way of thinking or mindset about developing them? So if you look at this slide here, we're going to go down through a set of features and we'll talk about the way that we thought about them in the past and the way that we're going to think about them now in the present with the cloud or distributed cloud application mindset. So first, let's talk about clients. In the past, we used to think that the clients of our services were the enterprise or the intranet. So it was generally pretty small scale, right? Your enterprise, you know, at Microsoft, for example, they have 100,000 employees, and maybe you have some partners that you work with too. But we're generally not talking in the millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people. But today, we're building services that are accessed by the public at large, and the public is a worldwide set of people from lots of different countries across the planet. So that the scale is wildly different now than it was when we were building services in the past. Now let's talk about demand. And the demand, because it was a relatively small people, it was a pretty stable set of demand too. But now you're hoping that the public some people will adopt your service, and if the service starts doing well, more and more people will adopt the service. And if it's doing great, then even more people will adopt the service. So it's hard to know in advance when you're designing the service, will you have very few people hitting it? Will you have a lot of people hitting it? And a lot of people would prefer massive growth over time. So that also requires that we design things for scale kind of from the beginning so that it can scale well as the load increases. And of course, during any normal business, there's probably going to be ebbs and flows of that where scale is high. Maybe it's seasonal throughout the year, or maybe it's for certain events if you sell tickets um, and so on. So you need to be able to dynamically scale up and down with these ebbs and flows. Let's talk about the data center feature now. In the past, you typically had a single tenant. That is, you would set up a service, and that would be the only customer that's hitting that service. Maybe if you had a, another customer, you would stand up another instance of that service, but they would be isolated or separated from one another. But in this world with data centers, especially public clouds, you have multi-tenants, where your code is running on the same machine as some other company's code. And so now you're competing for hardware resources on that node. And we have this problem, it's called the noisy neighbor problem, where your code might be placed on a node with somebody else, but that somebody else is getting a lot of network traffic and they're using a lot of memory, and that could adversely affect your service because you happen to be, end up being placed on the same box. So these kinds of things need to be thought about and considered when you're designing your service. Now let's talk about operations. Managing or the care and feeding of a service can be rather expensive. In the past, we would use people for this, and of course we have to pay their salaries. And you have to deal with things like upgrading the operating system, upgrading the hardware, upgrading the networking infrastructure, and so on. In this day and age, we're trying to get more to an automation uh, point of view, where these things are just happening automatically, which makes it much cheaper to run the service. So that's a lot of the benefit that people see in going with a public cloud provider, is that they don't have to worry about the network infrastructure, they don't have to worry about the load balancers, they don't have to worry about the hardware devices. What if a hard disk fails? What if a power supply fails? What if a network router fails? Right? You're kind of outsourcing that for people who do this all the time, and so you get some economy of scale there. We'll also talk about just the DevOps scenario a little bit later in the course where we're going to try to take the code that developers write and we're going to check that in and then we're going to automatically build that code, automatically run tests on that code, and automatically deploy new versions of that code into the cluster, um, ideally without any human intervention at all. So it just can happen on a regular basis, several times a day if you want to. You could be upgrading your live services running in a data center somewhere, and this allows you to be very agile and responsive to customers who might be reporting bugs or might be desiring new features. And it's just a great way to get into this rolling process of that whole thing. And we want to do it very inexpensively. Now let's talk about the scale feature. This is very closely related to the demand feature up above. In the scale feature, we have, you know, your service wants to be up um, on a is typically up on a few reliable PCs. That is, your company would buy a couple of PCs. You might buy very expensive ones that have a lot of CPU cores in them and a lot of RAM in them and very fast hard disks, which makes these PCs expensive. Uh, and then you would have a few of them. 
Well, in this new mindset, we're trying to get lots of cheap or inexpensive or commodity PCs instead that's cheap hardware, and we just assume that failure is going to happen. In fact, this term of failure, which is the next uh, line on, in this table, is something we're going to be talking about over and over and over again throughout this whole course. So let's move to failure now. When we were building services in the past, we never really considered that the hardware would fail. We would just assume the networking is fine, that the computer is going to be fine, that we the, the, the database engine is going to be fine. We might take backups you know, every once a week or something like that of the data that's in there. In this new world, because we're on these cheaper, more commodity PCs, it's more likely that they are going to fail. And so we have to embrace failure when we are designing or architecting these distributed cloud applications. We assume that failure is always possible, and we take that into account very early on when doing this architecture. And that requires a very different mindset. Again, something I'll be talking about repeatedly throughout this course is how do we design and architect our services to be resilient to failure. And then finally, machine loss, which is related to failure, is that in the past, if your machine that ran your database server failed, that was usually catastrophic. It meant that none of your clients could go and access your service. They couldn't look up anything. Customers wouldn't be able to make purchases at your service. And so now it was costing real money to your business. In this new world, the cloud world, we're thinking that machine loss is an expected thing. It's actually normal and even common for that to happen, especially if you're running at scale, it's much more likely that some of the hardware is going to fail on you. And so if we design and take this into account as we're architecting, then the failure is really no big deal. And we will design our services to be resilient against this and keep running even in the case of failure. Now there may be some loss of scale, there may be some loss of data, but for the most part, everything keeps running. And the more resilient you wanna be, against this, the harder it is for you to architect these kinds of applications and develop them, and the more costly it tends to be to run. So it's largely going to be a business decision, uh, first and foremost, as to how much to invest. And it may be that for your company, the service going down for an hour is not that big a deal. And it could be that for your company, the service going down for an hour is the loss of millions of dollars. And so you have to think about that and what it means to your business, and that will help drive how much effort you want to spend into really designing for failure and being resilient against it. Again, I will be talking about these things quite a bit more as we go through the course. So because of these uh, features and what we did in the past and the changes that we're now going to make in the present for cloud, we must do things differently when, in order to build these cost-effective, failure-resilient solutions. And there's many things that we have to do differently. On this slide, I just put two things in particular. The first is exception handling. Um, as a software developer, I've had many conversations with people and written a bunch of book chapters about exception handling. I spend a lot of time on this subject. And in the past, a lot of times people would write their code to catch all exceptions. Because if you don't catch an exception, it becomes unhandled, your service would go down and crash. And that means it was no longer responding to client requests that were coming into it. But this is really not the best thing to do in terms of managing state. If an application gets an unhandled exception, it usually means that something unexpected happened and the state of the data in the application is potentially in an unpredictable state right now. And continuing to have the service run under these circumstances might mean more data corruption and unpredictable results. So really the best thing to do for an unhandled exception is to have your application terminate, have it destroy any potentially corrupted state in memory, and then restart the application so then it is in, it is in a well-known good state and then pick up from there. But in the past, a lot of programmers haven't wanted to do that because when the application crashes, it stops taking requests from clients for a period of time. However, in this new world, in the present, now we can really do what is the right thing, which is allow the application to crash and to restart, 
And the reason why this is okay is because you're now gonna be running multiple instances of the same service on different machines. We're embracing this concept of failure. And so if one of the applications on one of the machines crashes, then the client request can still be handled by the other instances on the other machines. And so the clients are still being able to interact with your service successfully. Again, we'll be talking about this more as it goes on, but here's a real concrete example that has caused a lot of controversy for developers that I have worked with in the past as to how to manage exceptions. And a lot of times we've compromised in the past about how to do the right thing. The right thing is really crash and restart, and by designing for this cloud-based world where we are embracing the concept of failure, it now allows us to have less chance of state corruption and things work better. Also, let's talk about communication. When everything is working perfectly, when a client goes and sends a network request, communicates with a server via a network request, then those messages are sent in order, and you can pretty much expect that the message is gonna be sent exactly one time to the server. But in this new world where, again, we are embracing failure, it's possible that a client sends a message to a server, the server starts to process the request, but then the server crashes, especially because of the conversation we just had about exception handling. So that means in order to be resilient to this failure, the client must retry the operation against the server. So we have to design our applications, our client applications, to expect failure from the server and to automatically retry communication requests. It's also possible that a server might get the first request from a client, start to process it successfully, and then maybe the client receives a timeout for some reason. And the client may send the request again because it's going to do a retry. This means that the server could get the request multiple times, but we don't want the server to process the request multiple times. So the server has to be designed to handle these requests in an item potent fashion, meaning that there's no ill effect for for performing the same operation multiple times. Again, I'll be talking about these things more as the course goes on. And this also means that the messaging may occur out of order. So we have to be resilient about that when we are designing our applications.